welcome to the build, business builder this week. It has already started off really well with a lot of good chats and some laughs, and I'm already having huge amount of fun. So I hope everybody else is. Today we are learning from the amazing Janine Lingenfelder of Jelani Sales. Janine has built an entire business around helping you, the business owner, with your sales and getting you more customers. And today she is going to teach us some of her own daily routine and what she recommends you do in order to improve your sales. So welcome, Janine. Thank you so much. Looking forward to hearing from you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that intro. Really appreciate it. Um, just to give some little background about Jelani Sales for some of those very exciting people in the room. Um, Jelani Sales is a virtual sales office and what we do is we handle all sales related tasks for business owners from cold calling, database management, lead generation and social media management. Company launched in 2019 and going stronger by the day. Alrighty. Tamron, can I ask you to please share the presentation? I hope you guys are all ready. And um, I hope you all can see the presentation, perhaps make Tamron your main screen. Can I just get a thumbs up from everybody that they can see that? Perfect, thank you so very much. Okay, so that is Jelani Sales. Um, and if you go to the next slide, do you have a daily routine for your sales? In the chat bar, there's no right or wrong answer here, but do you have a daily routine for your sales? Yes or no, maybe, I don't know, whichever it is, but in the chat bar, please put that in so I can just see and get an idea of where we at. <laughs> okay, sort of, nice. If we go to the next slide. Okay, so daily routine for sales. So. We often get distracted um, by responding to emails. Um, do you feel scatterbrained during the day because there's just so much to do? And as a business owner or in a sales professional uh, profession, you need to generate an optimized sales routine that will allow you to achieve everything that you need to do for the day and that will boost opportunities for success, right? Now, creating such a routine, it's not impossible, but it is definitely, it definitely requires a lot and a lot of discipline. Now, today I'm going to be sharing some tips on sales routine in terms of how you can increase your chances of reaching those successes. And one of them is learn how to declutter your desk um, if it's not bringing you money. Because that's the main thing is we want stuff that brings us money. Now. The KonMari method is a pro-organizer, Mari Kondo's minimalism-inspired um, approach to tackle your stuff category by category rather than room by room. And the goal of this method is to have a house full of items that, does, that sparks joy. Now, this should be the same for your desk or your office. And there's, there's six rules around this. It's commit yourself to tidying up. Because if it's not tidy where you work, your mind is messy as well as your desk, right? So imagine your ideal weekday, because when you have it in your mind, you're going to work towards it. Finish discarding first. Tidy by category. Start with your email. Start with your filing. Whatever works for you in your space. Follow the right order that obviously brings you joy. And ask yourself every time you declutter if it's bringing you joy. Because if you don't have joy in your heart and joy in your day, you are not going to be productive. You're going to just feel, sorry for the word, crappy the whole time. And your clients are going to feel it and hear it over the phone. Because yes, people, people can hear a smile over the phone. It's a true story. Now, because you're actively choosing items that sparks joy and discarding what doesn't, the intention of this method is to end up making your life and your office clutter-free. Now, depending on your personality and your work habits, clutter and panic in your office can affect your productivity. And when productivity is down, so are profits. Clutter can also cost you money. If you replace something that was later found under a stack of papers or in a random drawer, 
And we've all done that. Oh my gosh, I made a note yesterday. Where is it? Oh, cook, it's gone. No, it's under the clutter. So the faster you declutter, the easier it will be to, for you to have that beautiful vision of how your ideal week day will look. To go to the next slide, the question is, are you feeling overwhelmed? And a lot of business owners do. They do feel overwhelmed because there's just so much to do. So my tip would be is start with small habits and then go big because we all want to be big. The idea is to start a habit with the smallest amount of time and impact um, the possible and then build on that daily. So for instance, don't do 20 push-ups a day. Do one push-up. After a week, go to three push-ups and so on and so on because you'll notice after a few weeks that your arm strength improves and then maybe you will be motivated to add another two the next week and so on and so on so start small because you will see the benefits and it comes back to please remember to celebrate the small wins don't discard them at all so plan out the next day at the end of your work day it sounds silly. And these things you might have heard of. You've probably heard of it, but start your end your day so that you know what your next day is going to look like. So make a list of your most important tasks and any complementary tasks that that needs to get done the following day. Knowing your game plan will help you get into the proper mindset for you to stay focused and achieve those goals. And it will help you to not struggle to get into that right direction. This is a big one. Empty your mailbox. How do you do that? Because as soon as I delete one, there's another one coming. Now, how amazing feeling would it be if you have zero emails at the end of each day? I mean, I think everybody will sleep so well. Now, of course, this means creating a filing system with folders and labels that you can easily manage or perhaps delegate to a virtual assistant. But you'll get in the habit of taking action with each email instead of letting it sit and taking up precious space, not just in your inbox, but up here in your mind. Because you, you are aware of the fact that there's five unread emails or unattended emails. Don't let things take space in your mind. They don't pay rent, get rid of it. You know that saying, right? Practice using positive visualization to, you, to your goals. Now, similar to meditation and positive visualization, it's about seeing yourself as though you've already reached your goals. Now, I want you just to do that. Each of us have got their own goals. Vision yourself that you've already achieved those goals. That feeling that you have. That is an amazing feeling, right? So when you see yourself in that light, your goal feels more realistic. Does that make sense? If you can already see yourself reaching your goal, it makes it more realistic. Embrace automation. This is part of not being so overwhelmed, is embracing automation. There's an app for everything. There's just not an app to get rid of the mother-in-law. But that, that will it probably get it probably gets it, probably gets. Anyway, so look around the remainder of what's on your desk. Is there an app to replace any of those physical items? But then the more important question is, will you use the app as a replacement? That is the trick right there, because there's an app for everything, but will you use the app as that replacement? Now the question states, can you get organized and improve your productivity at the same time? Hell to the yes, yes you can. It's a challenging task, no, no, no doubt about that. But even if you hire help, the results are well worth it. Some days are better, some days are worse. Look for the blessing instead of the curse. Be positive, stay strong, and get enough rest. You can't do it all, but you can do your best. This is one of my quotes that I read out to myself every single morning. And it helps me to get in that mindset to make sure that I reach what I'm supposed to reach to achieve what I want to achieve. Now, 
if we go to the next slide, this is one of my favorite things is to get in the zone. You know what you want, you get what you want, and you deserve what you want, right? So first and foremost, you have to make a decision to get to that zone space, right? It doesn't just happen. Now remember this today, you have to allocate time for the zone. We have to um, practice doing so in order for it to become a daily habit. If you get into the zone every single day, you are teaching your beautiful mind that this is something that is helping me achieve what I need to achieve. So I'm going to share some tips here with you as well as to how to do that. Um, and while I'm doing that, I know I see the chat bar is going. Um, if there is anything for me, I will go back and relook at it. Um, I just want to stay focused as to where I am and in the zone, right? Oh, look at that. It just works. Anyway, so put it on your calendar on a regular basis. Now, scheduling time for planning activities is probably the best and maybe the only way to ensure that it will get done. Please don't put it on a piece of paper. But where, where is it going to end? In the clutter. Unless you have decluttered, which means it's in your schedule. Establish a system for accountability to help you reinforce the need and the habit. Now, this can take a form of a coach, an accountability partner, a mastermind group, your own partner or spouse, anyone that you feel accountable to for allowing it to actually run through. So be sure that they know to ask you when you are allocating your time because now it becomes a habit. If you want your business to be a long-term success, it takes this kind of intentional discipline planning. So success really happens by mistake, right? So be sure that you are always planning for success and not just for the week or for the day, but for the next decade. Some people use affirmations to get into the zone. Affirmations in the sense of, I bless people with my service and product. I am enough. My products are world class. Those kind of things. I mean, but just by saying that, I feel like, oh, I can stay up for another 10 hours because I'm just so energized because I am enough. Now, today I want to read something out. Um, and it's also something I use every single day to help me to get one into the zone and into the right mindset. And if you go into the next slide, it is called I am a gladiator. Now, I'm not going to read that out now, but I want you to read that in your own space. Take a screenshot if you want, at your own space, and just read it because I feel it just, it's something that empowers you. Um, you can obviously get your own quote or your own saying that will help you to get into that mindset, but I'm sharing this with you because it's really powerful. It's been working for me for a very long time. And um, when you are done reading it, just give me that thumbs up. And also maybe in the chat bar, once you've read it in the chat, tell us how you, uh, what's that feeling you got when you finished reading it? If you can, that would be, that would be great. I would really, really appreciate that. And if we go to the next slide, the next slide is all about know your jam. Know how to sell. That's, that's intense, right? I think that's intense. Because how do you know how to sell? I don't know. No, I do know. I'm lying. <laughs> I do know. If we go to the next slide, uh, um, it's all about planning, right? Now, we've heard this before. Planning to fail is, um, planning to plan is planning to fail, right? We've all heard this. And I can see some heads are going, oh, yeah, yeah, so true. Now, what everyone should understand is that in business, the lack of professionalism leads to lost game, lost time. Nobody wins anything. Now, even if you are the seller or the buyer, you both leave the room unsatisfied. I learned a very, very valuable lesson. No matter what stage you are in your career or your business, you must always prepare in order to look professional in front of your customers. Because not being prepared leads to not being professional. I'll say it again. 
Not being prepared leads to not being professional. And the lack of professionalism leads to the lack of, who? small word, but big meaning, trust. The lack of professionalism leads to lack of trust. And where there is no trust, there is no deal, right? No one wins. No one wins. And we don't want that. We want to win, both you and your clients. So failing to plan is planning to fail. To go to the next slide is about understanding the sales process. Now, selling is, is a marathon, not a sprint. Remember that. The selling is a process, often a long and a hard one. I'm not going to be around the bush here, but it can be a very hard one. But the sales process is not merely a series of steps that result in a sale. It's, it's rather a way to connect with prospects and customers. That is the beauty of the sales process, is to connect with your prospects and customers. So over time, you understand their pain points and can provide solutions that make their job and lives easier. The results in customer loyalty, consistent sales, and over time, business growth. Isn't that just beautiful? Consistent sales loyalty and over time growth typical year sales process consists of about five to seven steps from prospecting preparation approach follow-up nurture reporting etc this is this process you can do how you want it to do to, to work for your business that's that's the beauty there's no right or wrong for for me personally, there's no right or wrong system. You need to do what works for you and your clients. Now, if we go to the next slide, you'll see that we're going to talk a little bit about prospecting. Not all prospects are created equal, right? Now, before you make a pitch, you need to verify that your product is a good match for the prospects you've identified. Very powerful. Now, this requires qualification call or a discovery call or whatever call you want to call it. But this is where you make those connections. The qualification call collects basic information about the need, the budget, the timeline, the authority that will allow you to identify prospects more likely to buy. Now, during this call, you should focus on the following key questions. What does the prospect need? And does this need align with my services or products? Do they plan to make a product purchase soon? And be bold. If so, ask them when. This is going to help you with that process, right? How much do they have to spend on your product or services? This is not becoming a bargaining tool. It just helps you to align everything with the prospect and the matching of your prospects and clients. Who has the authority to make the purchase? Once you've narrowed your list of viable prospects, take a deep dive into the needs of those who remain. Maybe set up another call with each prospect to further understand what they need and how you might meet the need. This is important. Now keep in mind that 95% of buyers make a purchase decision based on emotion. So understanding a prospect's emotional levels is super key. Super, super, super key. Because we are human. We all, we all are more attractive when it comes to certain emotions. And it's the same with your clients or your prospects. If you have emotion in it, boy, different conversation, different conversation. If we go to the next slide, this is now the follow up and close the deal kind of feeling. Because we want success. I also want to catch my own money like this little dude in the slide. 
Now, immediately after the sales call, follow up with the prospect, summarizing your conversation and reiterating the next step. This, that is very vital, is putting in what the next step could be. If additional information, oh, my power just went, everybody. Can you all still hear me or see me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, we can. Yep. Oh, dear. Okay, sorry about that. Light shedding. You can think. Okay, anyway. Um, where was I? Oh, yes, follow up um, with your prospects. Okay, so if you have additional questions, put that into your follow up. Okay. The next thing is um, to, to honestly make sure that uh, additional information is shared. So the prospect may respond with additional questions about your product. Answer the right, try if you can, answer right away and urge them to make a purchase decision by the date specified during the sales call. Um, you can make this easy by sending them a PDF contract with an electronic signature. Um, that helps the process a lot. You don't want the client now to go print it and you know do reprint and read this. No, make it easy for them because it's still a process for them as well. Okay. Um, and there's a thing called 20, 24 7 30, 3, 0, 24 7 30. I see a few heads are nodding, so they have heard this before, which is fantastic. There are three rules you simply must adhere to when it comes to follow up. Um, patience is a very, very rewarded little thing. And I know we all, we all, we all in a space where patience never go away. But it is such an important and a very vital thing when it comes to following up. You need to play the long game and follow up consistently over a period of time. No response does not mean game over. Please listen to me today. I've got 20 years of sales experience and no is not the end game. Okay. Make sure sales and marketing are aligned and have clear roles in the follow up. This will help you save time, avoid repetition, and present as a united front, and really protect your brand and who you are. You need a system in place, like a good sales CRM will go a long way to preventing embarrassing situations like duplicating, duplicating an email. Um, you've literally sent me an email five minutes ago. What is wrong with you? You don't want that from a client, right? Or making your prospect feel like they've been spammed. We all know that we no one wants to be spammed at all. I, I look like a green little monkey due to no power. Um, anyway, going on. So there are a few um, CRMs that you can use. I will pop them in the chat bar. One is called um, HubSpot and the other one is called Fresh Sales. These are really, really nice ones that I think um, you guys can go and have a look and just see for yourself what that is all about. So I am going to put that in the chat bar right now. Okay, there they are. Now, I'd like to share with you some different types of follow-up emails you can use. Um, obviously, this is not cast in stone, but it's just giving you an idea, of course. So after the pitch, Send an initial email one day after your initial presentation. So this is the 24 hours I was talking about, the 24 7 30. So after your pitch, send an initial email one day after your presentation. Use this as an opportunity to review their pain points and thank them for their time and include a call to action for the next step. Another follow up is reviewing with the decision maker or makers. If there are um, other stakeholders involved in the buying process, the sales cycle can take a little longer. And this is where the planning will come in, because if you prep your mind, knowing that there's more than one decision maker, you already know that this sales cycle can take longer than if there was only one. So send the first um, email 
seven days after the, the pitch, you will need to learn about the buying process during this, um, these calls as well. So it will give you that aspect of you giving each, each opportunity the time it needs. Okay. Unanswered follow up. Okay. <laughs> now, here is you will need a follow up sequence for when your emails go unanswered. Now, it comes back to don't spam them, please. Be careful here. But here you can offer additional resources. Ask them if they're still interested or the best, or ask them what is the best way to move forward. With unanswered follow up emails, this is also another opportunity where you can don't become salesy, but rather educate. Educate your client because in that follow up process, let's say, for instance, you've done a follow up 30 days later. Do you know how much can happen in 30 days? Exactly. So all it is, is to educate your client or prospect of the changes that took place in your business. Another email is the breakup email. If you are still not getting a response from your email initiative, the last thing to do is to wrap things up. Now you can either tell them that you're closing their file or use this as a last last pitch attempt to find out if they can maybe do another talk and see what is the next step what is their pain that they are still struggling with so i hope those tips have helped you a bit in terms of the follow-up process but i also want to share with you the following there are some things that you don't you don't do when it comes to follow-up oh there's actually quite a few but i'm only going to give you like a few like three or four not following up quick enough. Now, many thought leaders believe that you should follow up on leads like five minutes after that they've sent the inquiry. But this is unrealistic because we business owners, we're not just sitting waiting for that. We handle so many things on a daily basis. And you may be serving an international audience as well. However, it is very important to follow up as quickly as you can. That's where the systems in place will help you to ensure that you're responding as quickly as possible. The next one is to not focus on the company. Many, many, many people make the mistake of putting all the energy into the, into the prospect. Now, if you're selling into a large organization, you need to be engaging with multiple people, right? Always find out as much information about all the stakeholders involved and the buying process in order to accommodate all the decision makers. This is part of that sales process, right? The next one is to not follow up often enough. Now, this is very interesting. There's a study showing that 93% of converted leads are reached by the sixth, the sixth attempt. Do you know how high that is? 93? That is massive. So make sure that you do have a follow-up process to run and get that long-term relationships that you want with your clients. Very important. Also, the next thing that people fail at is not using the preferred channels. So what am I talking about here? 90% of the time, prospects will want to hear from sales reps by email. But some may prefer a phone call or another form of communication. So if I am going to send something, a, a client something by email and they prefer a WhatsApp, what am I doing? I'm aggravating that client. Already, we haven't even done anything really, but he's already put off. And that's what I mean by using the preferred communication channel. The other thing is not tracking your metrics. People without measuring your sales performance, how on earth, how do you know what is working and what is not working? So the CRM will definitely measure the open responses, the rates of each of your emails, 
And that will help you to see what is working and what is not working. It's a big thing. It's a really big thing. I will share something with you as well where they, with the, where there's templates of follow up emails. This is not done by myself, but it is something I use and it is something that helps a lot is sales follow up emails that you can use and modify to fit your needs in your business. So if we go to the next slide, you will see that it's now the nurture time, not selling, but rather educating your potential clients. So if all goes well and your prospect is now a customer, congratulations, woohoo, let's party. But the sales process isn't over yet. Satisfied customers provide a huge opportunity for cross-selling and upselling, right? Very true. Alex Turnbull, he is the CEO and founder of Groove, he noted that upselling isn't just a sales tactic. It's a customer's ha um, happiness tactic that can help you build deeper relationships with customers by delivering more value. How beautiful is that? It is so beautiful. Now there's, there's a formula, the threes formula that I want to share with you today. So three days after the sale, check in to make sure that the client is satisfied. That's a big thing because if the client is satisfied, whoo, you feel good about yourself and you can move forward, right? Three weeks after the sale, check in to see if the client has any questions on the product or services at hand or what was discussed. And three months after the sale, check in to confirm satisfaction with the product or service that you have given. A big thing. Don't wait for something to go boom and your client is unhappy. Have that process in place to follow up with your clients and find out about their satisfaction. You know why this is so important? Because this allows the opportunity to ask for a referral. That is the beauty of that, is to ask for a referral. Now, the next slide will show reporting. And I've mentioned that before. Accuracy and consistency. Now, collecting sales information and compiling it into a sales report is a standard part of business management, right? Sales reports provide an accurate description of performance and progress towards your sales goals. Having a sales reporting strategy and knowing how to produce useful sales reports ad advances the awareness of your own performance, encouraging thoughtful breakdown and shapes long-term sales methods. That is quite a lot to take in. But if you think about it, without the reporting, everything is like in the sky. How do you catch everything? How do you know what's working? How do you know what's not working? Now, reporting is an ongoing process. I can promise you that. And that requires frequent updates. This is where you have someone that can do it for you. And this, what's nice as well is you don't always have to pay someone. There are energy exchanges that's taking place. Bought a deal for a better, better word, where you can actually still get this done by outsourcing it and yet work on your business. You may generate this daily, this report weekly or quarterly or yearly depending on what you want to learn from the data, of course. Now, reports can focus on the overall sales performance, and you can use the sales report for strategy development sessions with your business coach or accountability partner, which I've mentioned earlier, right? Sales reports are important because they promote awareness of a company's overall performance. Even if you're one person, it doesn't matter. It is so vital. The insights you gain from creating reports may impact your success in so many ways. And those ways are promoting accountability. Tracking yourself or your team's performance in sales reports encourages everyone to be accountable for their sales numbers. 
and reviewing information from sales reports also shows the strengths in their performance that they can use to improve. Because we all can improve. We all improve probably every single day in our lives because we learn something new every day, right? Through this reporting, it can highlight successful strategies. So when a, when, when, when a company implements a new strategy, it can use the sales reports to determine how policies changes influences sales. Very interesting, because policies can influence sales. Identifying challenges is also another thing that can help. If sales reports shows unusually low numbers for a particular period, salespeople can actively search for the source of those changes and start brainstorming together ways to actually overcome these challenges whether it's with your with your business coach or whether it's with an accountability partner it's also going to help you to make accurate projections you have to have these now collecting the data in sales simplifies the process of forecasting if you don't know your numbers what are you doing you're doing something wrong i can promise you so it helps you forecasting your sales and projecting growth over time Now I'd like to say some, a few other tips with regards to the reporting process you can use. Is to develop sales report templates. Now create standard templates, don't be complicated, you don't have to be complicated, but create standard templates for different types of sales reports to update information easily for each sales cycle and develop, develop consistent documentation around this. This will help you to showcase what works, what doesn't. Some people use a sales dashboard, like me, I've got a whiteboard and it works. But you can download sales software tools that will include a sales dashboard. With that will automatically display, display the key data to guide sales efforts. Sales dashboards often have features that automatically generate graphs for you to analyze. That is awesome. That is awesome. Because some people like to see graphs. Some people like to see numbers. So it comes back again to you as the person or the business owner, right? So in short, if you go to the next slide, it is really just to make sure that you know where to fit what puzzle, right? And if you look at the slide, learn, learn to declutter your desk if it's not bringing you money. Don't feel overwhelmed. Know your jam. Planning to, uh, failing to plan is planning to fail, right? Prospecting. Follow up to get that success. Reporting, nurturing. That is super vital. Super, super vital. So if you go to the next slide, we want to, at the end of the day, celebrate success. This is the end of my talk. I really, really do hope that you enjoyed it. You took some tips from it. And um, there's obviously enough time for some Q&As or guidance in some way. It would help if I unmuted myself. That was amazing. Thank you. That was really, really helpful. I'm sure that everyone wrote down at least one thing that, that they could really use to improve their process in the future. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave open up. Guys, you can put your, your microphones back on and uh, ask Janine your questions. You have full access to her and her sales knowledge. No one? <laughs> Don't be shy. This is a safe space. I promise I'm, a, I'm quite a fun person. <laughs> <laughs> even changes color. Yeah, I even, yeah, exactly. Even change color. <laughs> Janine, I, I would, I'll ask a question since no okay. one is. Um, I know you do as part of your, your service, you do cold calling. 
for, yeah. for people. So what do you recommend in terms of if, if someone is going to try and, and contact a cold prospect, how do you recommend they start that conversation? So it depends on what, the, what it is that you want to sell or get that person's attention to. So normally a, a, phone, a, a cold call shouldn't be just around the sale. Okay. Know who you're phoning. Know the client. N try and get as much information before you do cold calling. So there's a lot of research that needs to take place when it comes to the cold calling side of things. And make sure that you are confident and you are in a safe space mentally. Your mental state plays a very big, big role because if you are down, and you are doing a, a cold call, I can promise you, your prospect will feel it and hear it. What are you going to do? You're going to be demotivated because they are already not ready for you. Mm -hmm. So your mindset needs to be 100% correct. And this is where the accountability partner kicks in as well. You can quickly phone them and say, listen, I'm going to do 20, phone, 20 cold calls today. You need to put me in the zone. You need to, that's, this is your responsibility. You put me in the zone. And once you're in that zone, use that power and, and phone for one hour those cold calls. That is, and don't get despondent of if you get a few no's. Mm. Because it's not, the one thing people take around cold calling is they take it personally. My God, that person doesn't even know you're from bottom soap. Who can? Move on, get to that process where you want to be. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, no, that does. And and I, I like your end bit there as well. It's like, don't take it personally. Because we do. We take we take rejections mm -hmm. very personally. It's our business. Yeah. It's our product. This is our service. This is who we are. And and yeah. we do. We're very personal when someone says no, but it's it's not personal. It's not yeah. personal. No. Don't go back and say, oh, how dare you? That's a no. <laughs> you are in the red zone. I'm not touching you ever again. Don't be like that. That client is just not ready for you at that time. Run them back in three months. They might just be your biggest client. I know because I was talking about experience, it happened to me. Megan, you said you had a question. Um, thanks, Janine. Um, I thank you for the presentation. I enjoyed that. Definitely took some notes. I just wanted to um, pop something in there. You touched on it slightly, and you and I chatted about this a bit yesterday during our meeting as well. Um, I, I said to Janine that I, I've been in technical um, product and services sales for 20 years before I opened my business. And although I, was, I ended up in a position of sales manager in the technical space, et cetera, et cetera, I realized in the last two years that I actually don't like a very particular and very important part of sales. I love the connection. I love the human part of it. I love finding out more. I like researching for the solution, but I don't like the target attached to the month end. So I was that for 20 years in, in technical sales where you're selling products that start at 200,000 bucks a pop. So that's an interesting discovery for me. And that just highlighted for me what people like Janine that do this and speak to us about these things always say attach the value of what you are putting out there as the key component of your conversation not the fact that i've got to make target my manager's chasing me taking it personally that this you know the person's going to just see your number and ring off on the other end before they even answer i think it's just an important thing to suddenly figure out where in the sales space you sit and what type of sales approach you prefer. Because when I le left certain companies, my clients still speak to me 20 years later. Why? Because that connection was there. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I hated that part of sales and I only discovered this after I left <laughs> the industry. So just you know, a, a good point to remember the, the value of what you're selling. You must be convinced of that before you even pick up that phone to cold call that person or to actually step into that pitching room. So mm -hmm. just thought I'd throw that in there because that was very interesting for me to finally realize 20 years later. Indeed so, indeed so. That's why I say, 
there's a lot of research that takes place with cold calling. It's not just picking up the phone and call. And once you've established your rhythm and your zone section, all those things will fall in place, knowing your value, knowing what you can really do, understanding their pains even before they know what their pains are. Because that can happen. That can happen. And a, a confident boost, people, I will put my number in this chat. If you need a con if you need a boost, I think there's a lot of people in this room that really knows me. I am an extremely positive person. Nothing gets me down. I will always find a loophole because there's a loophole for anything. It gets to the mindset I want to be. So yeah, I just want to put that out there. <laughs> I've put uh, Janine's uh, website and LinkedIn profile links in the chat box. I do recommend that you you connect with her. Uh, first of all, because she really does make an amazing back back office sales office for you. If you if you you listen to everything she said, and you know what, and you, you your 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 conclusion was actually, you know what, I just don't want to do this for myself. <laughs> too hard <laughs> then call Janine but if you are going to do it for yourself and you want some some encouragement and some positivity call Janine she will help you either way indeed Janine I had a question um I know it's uh, this is all related to sales um obviously I deal with uh, with procurement and logistics uh but I think where it's kind of relevant is from what I'm hearing is that you've got a, a similar set structure in the way that you like to approach um a situation um so on my side I definitely I, I look at a format which I can utilize to work with as a template before I approach somebody because essentially what I'm doing is I'm cold calling say a farmer um, where I've got to negotiate price with them and I've got to essentially pull a semi-sales strategy with them and mm -hmm. work out terms and conditions and things like this. Um, so do you, do you maybe have any pointers as to how to optimize, um, say, an approach uh, like a ABC kind of scenario where you say, hey, this is maybe a way of think something you need to look at when you maybe do a cold call to a, a potential supplier um, and a way that uh, you can negotiate with them in a more, um, I suppose, a more neutral way, because my approach is generally quite straightforward and more sub as, uh, like submission sales. I'm trying to get them to give me what I want, but it takes time uh, because I often don't have a whole lot of time to spend with a person. What I try to do is get the point across directly with all the information that I need um, and then go and see them personally. So I don't know if you've got any pointers as to maybe how I can optimize on my side of looking at how to do cold calls with, uh, with a prospective supplier um, and maybe uh, some form of negotiating techniques that you've picked up through the industry that might potentially help. Yeah, absolutely. So firstly, if you do use a script or some form in paper, try not to sound like a robot. Try not to read what you have done, what you've put down in paper, because we humans, we, 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 we tend to do that. If it's written down, we kind of read it. But be authentic, really be yourself. Don't try and change for the client, okay? Mm -hmm. when, you, when you also do the, the cold calling is, as I said, make sure that you've done the, the, the right research, okay? And of course, knowing that you're speaking to the right farmer. Make sure that he is still a farmer. Mm -hmm. A lot can change, okay? But also, when you start doing the cold calling, make it every single time about them. Don't say, yeah, but I can do this. Yeah, but I can give you a better price. Oh, but wait, I can also, I can actually also, I can act, no. Because people don't like to hear about you. They want to hear about themselves. Mm -hmm. And the more you make it about them, I can promise you the sales process will be far easier. Now, you've mentioned... It takes time. You don't have the time to go through all these emotions, if you will, because you kind of just want to tell him, listen, I can flip and save you money, dude. Can you just not stop procrastinating? I can do this for you. That's where we want to get to the point for them to just sign and on the dotted line and go ahead. But if mm. you can, if, if there's a way that after those calls, if you can email them twice a week with value in your email and Adding that to them, 
it will also help with your process and help them with the mindset of this guy is actually an expert in his field. I really want to deal with Matthew. Mm. Um, I'm more than welcome, Matthew, to have a um a, a one to one with you via virtual Zoom, just to hear your process in in full term, and and see where I can give you some tips, especially when it comes to the procurement um, side of things as well. Yeah, that definitely does sound like a plan. So look, I, I won't elaborate too much because I know everybody else also might have some potential questions, but I'll get your information from uh, from the Farsight team over there. <laughs> <laughs> and then we can uh, we can definitely have a, have a chat because look I've got tons to go through and sometimes maybe a bit of an external perspective you know I mean Tristan and I go through each other's documents and we look at our strategies together but um, you know he's dealing particularly with sales and um, I'm dealing with a lot of shipping inco terms uh, setting up trade agreements you know and all these types of things mm -hmm. um, so yeah it's quite extensive so I, I think I'll leave it there uh, so I don't get everybody too worked up <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. I look forward to that, Tristan and Matthew. Go. Cool. Thanks, Matthew. Does anyone else have a question for Janine? You have her undivided attention right now. <laughs> oh, um, great. A great um, question. Oh, sorry. You can go first. No, ladies first, please. Okay. Thank Aww. you, Tristan. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to say that was a great presentation, Janine, and I truly learned a lot tonight. And I just want to give a testimonial for Janine as well before I ask my question. Um, I've been I've been working on a couple of projects for the last two, two or three months. And um, since I'm not a very good salesperson yet, I've asked Janine to help me with it. And thanks to the work that Janine has put in for me and the projects that I was working on was a roaring success. So thank you so much for that, for that Janine. And um, the question that I wanted to ask was, um, I know that, would I be correct in saying that collaboration also plays a big role in, in the sales process, if I can put it that way. The reason I'm, I'm asking is because for me, um, I need to at this at this point in time in my industry because I'm a designer, but also because I'm a printer as well. I always look for people to collaborate with instead of um, seeing them as competition. So if I um, contact a supplier and I want them, you know, to help me and to to be my my main supplier, I need to build trust. I know I need to build a relationship with them, but I also at the end of the day want them to work with me as well, so that when they supply, uh, you know, when they become my supplier, I also want them to be the first person that they call if they get a printing. Job Job or if they get a design job so that I can help them just like they're helping me. So for me in the past, I've seen because I'm a team player, I love collaborating with people. Um, if I build a, a strong relationship with someone, they're always the first person that comes to mind when I need something or when I want something done. But how do I make sure that I'm also the first person um, that comes to mind if they need something? It is such a great question. It is such a great question. And I, I absolutely love collaboration purely because teamwork begins with trust, right? And alone, we all, we've heard this before, alone we can't do everything, but together, wow, wow, that's where the magic happens. So what I'm trying to say is stay in contact with those suppliers if you if, let's talk about suppliers now specifically don't just contact them when you need them stay in contact with them through the 24 7 city once a week or twice a month send them an email but don't make it salesy or about you and your services but make them aware of something in their industry what does that do it builds the fact that you always have them top of mind and you're making them feel VIP all the time. And that's where you will stay top of mind. To give you an idea or an example, not an idea, an example, when I was um, still in corporate, um, I worked for an advertising company that does billboards, etc. For a year and three months, 
a year and three months. People, that's a long time, eh? It's a long time. It's a lot of follow-up. It's a lot of coffees with the person. And what I did is twice a month, I just sent an email to say, listen, did you know that um, X, Y, and Z is, is in your center? Or did you know, did you know? And in that year, I also went there face to face, just having a coffee where the guy, his name is Jack, he said, Janine, I'm not, I don't want anything from you. I'm like, I don't care. I'm just here to coffee. I just want to scroll around through what, see what new paints you have or whatever it is. And literally after a year and three months, he phoned me and said, oh, by the way, Janine, I am now ready to take on five billboards on the highway. What happened? He turned out to be one of my biggest sales contracts that I signed. So it comes back to being consistent and not salesy, but just stay top of mind. Just stay top of mind by follow up and just be the expert you are in your field, but letting them that letting them know as well. I hope that answers your question, Clarissa. Yes, yes. Thank you, Janine. I really appreciate it. Many a pleasure. Sure. Yeah, just a note on that, you know, I've got a question, but it's very true, you know, keeping in touch with your clients is not, it's not always about trying to sell them something, it's maybe just checking in, how's your business doing, how's pro progression coming along, you know, we, uh, before we went into the import export, we were, we started with fresh produce, and then we moved on to supplying chilies to manufacturers, and then we went into import export, and the chili thing, you know, we we encountered so many challenges, you know, it, 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 all of the things that we did, so many challenges. But, you know, now, now we're setting farmers up with clients that directly and we broker in agreements and then we sit down and we pretty much build a supply chain that's going to work with them, save them money, and it's going to be cost effective and it's going to be efficient, you know. Um, and I had a client that was working for another company, or we, we had a client, and, you know, just keeping in touch, phoning him, checking in on how he's doing. Now I know that he's got a child. Now I know who he's, who he's godfather, uh, who he's godfathering for, you know, like, and learning about that stuff. You know, he phoned us up the one day and he said to us, uh, hey, you know, I've broken away. I've started my own company. I'm going to place an order with you sometime. You know, and then we kept in touch for another three months. And uh, this week, actually, he phoned me on Monday. And he said, cool, I'm ready. Can you send the first load of product? And he asked me for... A volume you know and i said yeah no we can do it because we've been keeping in touch with the farmer and just letting them know we are getting them out onto the market but it's going to take time you know you need to build that relationship and we got to that point and he phoned the farmer and he doubled his order you know and then uh, he phoned me back a day later and he said hey by the way do you still have access to this and we said well uh, yeah we we do you know so it really just now is becoming one of our biggest uh, chili clients, you know, and it's not even a space that we're still focusing on. It's just something that we kept in touch with. Um, so it's, it's such a learning curve, even for me, like it was such a wake up call because it happens every now and again. And then you just need someone to come along and do that. And you're like, Oh, wow. Sure. It still happens that way. <laughs> like... No, it's true. You kind of want to stay the yellow pages for your client or your prospect. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. If they want something, all they do is find Tristan because he knows everything. That's the yeah. ultimate goal is with all our clients that they must only phone you because you know everything and everyone. And yeah. that, if you can do that, oh boy. Um, what I loved about your story, Tristan, is that the key is to set realistic customer expectations, right? And then not just meet them, but exceed them. And that's Kind of what yeah. you've done is because you you were able to do this 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 oh and that oh oh, oh and that um yeah. and that's that thank you for sharing that that was really a beautiful story yeah because while while you while you're waiting for them you're still growing your business so you've got other bigger aspirations and goals and if you keep focusing on that because you have your customer in mind of where they're going to go mm. you know when when they need it you've got it you might not have had it when you approached them but you've got it now yeah that's the, the key but anyway, my, my question actually falls more into decluttering. So I am a hoarder of information. Um, you know, I've, I've got books and pages and notes of things from things that I pick up from all over the place, you know, and um, it's, uh, I just wanted to kind of get 
some sort of feedback there with that, like when you're decluttering, mainly with your, your prospects and your clients, you know, you're trying to separate the client from a prospect and then you're also looking at certain things and, you know, you want to kind of throw something out, but you also know in the back of your mind, you really want them as a client, but you're also not really able to get through to them. Mm. Now you're sitting with this thing of you've got the information on your desk, you get rid of it, you put it in the back and wait for them to eventually see that you're, you're out there on the market and they come back to you, or do you keep trying to in, in, inform them of, of uh, services that you could potentially offer them? Um, and then moving into prospect and client phase, like uh, when, you, when you quote a client and then they don't respond, they're like, cool, send me a quote. And you're like, cool. And then they say, no, I'm happy with everything. Let's move forward. And then they just don't respond. How, how do you then keep that on your desk? Do you keep it in a pile for a week and then you just put it aside and say, well, then that's done? Or do you kind of keep it there and keep trying to contact the client? Because it's, it's such, a, such a fickle one because now they're, you know, your, your value is being tested and so is theirs. You know, as a client, do you want them now as a client? Um, and are you going to now try and get a hold of them and, and start speaking about why they're not ready to buy um, or what is the holdup or any of that, you know, and, and I've got, I've got an example now with a client, you know, he wanted, um, uh, quite an extensive supply chain, you know, which, uh, Matthew and I built for him and, and we proposed it and he was happy with it and then he never, he never bit on it. You know, and, and uh, randomly about a week ago, I sent him a message and said, you know, you know, and then he jumped on it. He's like, cool, you know, do I keep him on board? Because he just doesn't respond. He says, yes, he's ready to go. And then he's going to give me a call. And then he doesn't call me back. Um, or do I just kind of walk away from it and declutter that off the desk, throw the document away and just kind of stop contacting that client? That is a big no, 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 no. Ah. This is where you identify those clients or, or uh, potentials that outsource that to a virtual assistant. Make a virtual assistant part of your sales team and part of your process when it comes to the follow up. Um, there are ways where you declutter by outsourcing to someone else who's more professional and more focused on getting that client to that final yes on paper and actually moving forward so that you can declutter your mind and focus on the big stuff. If you know that your follow-ups are being dealt with and all your emails that's coming in is from your, your outsourced person to say, oh, I just got you this deal. Oh, you know this guy that you wanted for three months? Oh, we just got this deal. If you know your follow-ups are being dealt with, you are decluttering already. And that's a big thing. Um, mm -hmm. I'm doing that at the moment myself, where I have to let go. And I know, oh my God, I know letting go is the worst thing because this is your baby. This is your business. Now yeah. you want to give it to someone else? What is wrong with you? But at the end of the day, it be, that can be such a beautiful transition. And if you can build a trusted team that knows your values, that works within your, um, your follow-up process, etc., and you are still growing and doing what you love, because you must remember, if you do stuff you don't love, it's not bringing your, yourself joy. And you're in business to enjoy life, right? So my, my, my tip would be is see if you can find someone you trust to outsource to who can do those, who can do your pains for you, but yet still mm. grow, if that makes sense. Right, yeah, I got you. That's not a raving fan moment. <laughs> And say, Explore Van has everything you need jacked up, inline, efficient, cost effective, and got your back. Explore Man.
the explore yeah. van. If you look at the van in Janine's background, you have oh, virtual yeah. assistants that are ready to just a team their car into your driveway and take your pain off your back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will, I will keep in touch with you, Tristan, um, and maybe invite you as a guest to explore Van. Um, it's a beautiful network that's just around virtual assistants, and there you might able to find a VA that fits within your in your scope of needs and try them out for a month and see how that goes. Nothing is cast in stone, and you have to try everything to to see what works, right? Yeah. I've added my uh, email to the link, so you uh, to the chat box if you want to grab it. Okay, I see it. I am Definitely. saving the chat. It's a movement. <laughs> Save the chat. <laughs> Lead generation 101. <laughs> <laughs> Especially in the online world, right? <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, that sounds very cool. I'd love to check it out. I was actually chatting to Tam. Uh, earlier about all of this, you know, setting up our SOP so that we can slowly start outsourcing and just letting go and entrusting someone else to handle your baby, which mm -hmm. is uh, probably one of mm -hmm. the most freakiest things, you know. Yeah, it definitely yeah. is, but it can be one of the most beautiful things you, you, you do for yourself is that. Yeah, okay. Uh, the only way to scale up is to get brave. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that comfort uh, zone is not always the best zone, right? Oh, no. And, you know, the thing is, you are you are very, very passionate about what you've done. You've got the code that you have in place. You have a way that you deal with people. You have a code of ethics that you live by. And can you afford to find someone that's going to mess that up after all your hard work? Because how do you come back from someone that ruins it? But yeah, uh, that comes back to communication and the right team, right? Absolutely. And it also comes back to policies and processes in place. If those things are in place, then the transition is easier. Um, so yeah, definitely. Awesome. This is such an awesome session. This is really good. Thank you so much, Janine. Uh, a lot of a lot of value. <laughs> very nervous but i hope i didn't talk too fast no that was, you were um, fantastic you have look at it, everyone shaking their heads you were fantastic you know, you've got your flow going you know what you're doing you got this so. no thank you so much for all the support and for being so humble and participating in the q and a i really appreciate it it was a Thanks. great session i am going to share the recording of this session uh, with everyone who did attend, but also the people who signed up and didn't make it. So we'll get we'll get you out there. And I do encourage anyone watching the recording to connect with Janine, because uh, as I said earlier, it is very worthwhile for your sales process and just just for your general positivity to have a good chat with Janine. So give her a shout and have a meeting with her. And if anyone is watching and uh, is wondering what the Farside Business Builder is, um, I would encourage you to Google us and come have a look as well so you can attend our weekly training on different topics and meet more incredible people like Janine who can help you with the different aspects of your business. Thank you to everyone who did attend today. I, you're all smiling, so I hope you had a good time. <laughs> and I hope to see you all next week. Okay.